Hello, everyone. Happy Friday to you. Happy, happy Friday. I'm Dr. Nika White, the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC and also the host of Intentional Conversations podcast. This is where we intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. We are so glad you're here. We've been anticipating you. And uh, we know that you have a number of things that you could be doing on this Friday during this hour, but the fact that you have joined us, we're really grateful for that. And um, we do commit to delivering really rich content for you. If you would, please go to the chat and let us know where you're joining the conversation from today. This helps us to understand where um, the audience is coming from. It's always a great treat for us to see and hear that. It gives us an opportunity to extend our audience beyond just the window of time that you may be connected here with us today. And if you also feel inclined, I will ask that you share information um, regarding, you know, maybe an organization that you are a part of, or perhaps you desire to share other information about yourself. Um, including your LinkedIn or any other social media where you want us to connect with you. We do appreciate that. I also want you to be aware that we do have closed caption that has been enabled today. So if that's of value to you, then I certainly encourage you to make sure you're taking um, advantage of that. This is our way of really just honoring um, disability um, inclusion. And I am being supported today by my amazing team at NWC. And um, we are headquartered in Greenville, South Carolina, full service diversity, equity, and inclusion organization. And so one of the things we like to do during our segments is to ensure that we are leveraging an opportunity to help create a sense of community. And so I will ask that um, as you are um, joining with us today, if something comes up in the conversation that really aligns and resonates with you, then please try to share in the chat if our guest co-host says something that's really resonating or maybe a question comes up, um, go to the chat. And if you are also looking for some resources um, or perhaps you have resources that you can share, then you know what to do. Take it to the chat. That's our way of learning with and from each other. And again, welcome to Inclusion, uh, Intentional Conversations, a podcast where we intersect diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. Okay, once again, if you're just joining us, you have joined the Intentional Conversations podcast, and this is an opportunity that NWC, Nico White Consulting, we bring to the community at large to help people learn with um, and, from, and from each other as we try to really deepen our commitment and our understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. And um, we're so glad that you're here with us today. I'd like to always take a moment to share with you that not only do we have this opportunity to convene live uh, with our podcast for each week's intentional conversations, um, but we also take the audio and then we make it available in a podcast capacity. So if you know of individuals who can't make this live um, program, but they are really interested in connecting with this community, then I certainly encourage you to encourage them to take advantage of either the live replays through our YouTube channel or to subscribe to the podcast. Now, one of the things that I often like to do with this community is share some of the exciting news that are on the horizon. Many of you um, are aware that I have been working for the past several months um, with Forbes Books on book number three, and it is now complete. It is now available for pre-orders, and I'm super excited to share that with this community. So I hope that you will support this effort. It has been a labor of love, but it's called Inclusion Uncomplicated, and it's about a um, transforming people. It's a guide to help simplify DEI to make it practical. 
Now, I know that we're getting towards the end of August, but I dare not continue to amplify that it is National Black Business Month. And this is my way of just helping to ensure that in some small way, we can show forth recognition and appreciation to all of the Black business owners that are doing the darn thing day in and day out. And as a Black business owner myself, I salute each of those business owners. And I know what the journey is like. And um, I am just so glad that we are in the game. We are competing effectively. And and that um, economic inclusion is something that um, our society is paying closer attention to these days. Now, um, this is also August 26th, which means it's Women's Equality Day. So please join us in recognizing Women's Equality Day. This is recognition of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which allowed women the right to vote. Now, I will say, though, that even though on that date in 1973, this amendment was passed, it certainly did not necessarily lead to all opportunities for voting for all women. Women of color continue to struggle after that date. But it is in recognition today that we just acknowledge the start of that process and how it has really helped um, all women to be able to, um, you know, stand with great pride knowing that we are able to vote and exercise our right to vote. So that's critically important. Here on Intentional Conversations podcast, we like to give you a little bit of heads up for what you can expect and anticipate for the weeks to come. And so I am so excited to share with you that on Friday, um, September the 2nd, we will be kicking off the month um, with a new guest co-host, Deepa. Prashathaman is actually going to be joining us, and she is amazing. She is the author of The First, The Few, The Only, and we're going to focus on the well-being of women of color in corporate America. So if you don't know Deepa, make sure you join us on September the 2nd to hear that rich conversation. And then thereafter, the following Friday, we'll be right back here at the same time. Sia Justice is going to be joining us, and we're going to be talking about ERGs also known as employee resource groups, and how they can improve employee well-being, create high potential talent pipelines, and how they also can support and advance key business initiatives. And so if you're interested in that topic, certainly feel free to join us for that conversation. And then in the um, next Friday of the month of September, which is the 16th, Andrea Tatum is going to be joining us. So we're going to be talking about how do we you know, discuss career pivots and finding your lane and DEI work with or without a title. And I love that because oftentimes we believe that this work only belongs to those who have the title of chief diversity officer, manager, director, and that's not the case. We all have to be a part of this work. So I hope that you will join me and Andrea for that conversation. Now, if you know of a guest co-host that you believe will be very instrumental in sharing some rich content with this audience, we want to hear from you. Many of our guest co-hosts have come by way of recommendations from this community, and so let us know who's coming up in mind for you. you can, we are currently recruiting actually guests for Q1 of 2023, and you can send those co-host recommendations to my colleague, Amora Carter, at amora at nicolite.com. Now, it's that time in our podcast hour where I have the pleasure of providing a formal introduction of our guest co-host today. Lisa Galopter is the CEO and founder of Tech Equitable, using technology to make workplaces more equitable. Tech Equitable provides a confidential platform to address bias, discrimination, and harassment. Lisa has worked on products that have been used by billions of people and pioneered several internet technologies, including Shockwave, Hulu, and the ascent of online video. Previously at the Obama White House, Lisa was the Chief Digital Service Officer for the Department of Education. And prior to that, she served as the Chief Digital Officer for BET Networks at Viacom. Lisa has been named one of Inc.'s 100 Women Building America's Most Innovative and Ambitious Businesses, Fast Company's Most Creative People, and she serves on boards for the Obama Foundation, Time's Up, and the Education Trust. Lisa is one of the first 40 Black women ever to have raised over $1 million in venture capital funding. She is also proud to be a Black woman with a computer science degree, and her words, not mine, go STEM. 
So in your own way, Vodcast community, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but I would love for you to please and kindly take to the chat. Welcome our guest co-host today. Let her know how appreciative we are for her sharing her time with us. It is really early where she is, which is in Oakland, California. And so it even makes it more special that she's here with us. And so Lisa, just in your own way, I invite you to greet this community. Uh, maybe share something about yourself that we wouldn't know by reading your bio, um, perhaps intersecting our identity or anything that just helps us to draw a deeper connection to you and how you show up to this work. Awesome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Plus, I can't wait to buy, wait to buy your third book. Plus, I can't wait to see all the other uh, guests who are coming on here. And I'm so grateful to be in community with you all. I love uh, everybody kind of showing up in the chat and talking about about where they're where they're where they are today, uh, physically, uh, and just the the work that I know that everybody is doing. And I just I feel like there's something about us coming together in community as opposed to being disconnected and kind of working on our own. So I really am so grateful to be here doing all this work with doing the same work with you all. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. It does make me blush a little bit sometimes. <laughs> um, I think there's there's kind of two things that I would add that I'd like to emphasize uh, in terms of my background and kind of what brought me here, what brought me to Techwitable. Um, I think the first is, you know, we are much more comfortable now talking about gender and race in the workplace. Uh, we don't so much talk about socioeconomic status. Uh, so I come from a low income background. Uh, and so while yes, I do have a degree in computer science, a bachelor's degree in computer science from an Ivy League school, I went to Brown. Uh, it took me 24 years to get it. Uh, I am a proud member of the class of 2011. Uh, and so it is it's one of those things that we don't so much talk about that 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 experience of what you are what you've been exposed to and what your norms are and what uh, what other people can do because you know they don't have to work 40 hours a week to put themselves through school and what that looks like and feels like i don't think we really talk about that enough especially in the workplace and so um, actually, that's one of the things uh, we're trying to do. And I have a very small startup, but one of the things we're trying to do is actually keep, um, like, is, is talk about our, our diversity numbers. And one of the things that we've actually tried to start adding to see how it goes is uh, socioeconomic status, like growing up before you were 18, uh, wow. because uh, over a third of our of our employee base, this is their first jobs in tech. And their first time making over six figures. So that's kind of part of what I, I like. It's, it really does, to your point about intersectionality, we're also uh, mostly all black and brown. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that's the idea of actually thinking about all of the different factors that go in. I was going to say something else, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I love that. We um we have a lots of time to dig into to whatever topics that you're having a lot of energy around. So feel free to to take the conversation wherever you um you you feel empowered to do so. So you, your bio, I finished with when I said your words, go STEM, which I, I'm also a big fan of. Also, although they're your words, I'm a fan of them as well. But why are STEM degrees and classes really important and specifically important for um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and women? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the reality is tech is everywhere and everything is tech now, right? You can't, there's no escaping it anymore. There's, you can't work in finance and not understand tech. You can't work in dance and not understand tech. Sports, right? It is, there is a place in every industry and in anything that you might be passionate about where tech can play a role. And us having a seat at the table is going to dictate what the future looks like, right? So much has changed by the by technology technological inventions, right? Like, where were we? I'm trying to do the math. 15 years ago, before there was an iPhone or yeah. or any kind of mobile, right? Smartphone, mm -hmm. um, right? A, uh, like, again, imagine if there had been more folks of color, more women on the Facebook, Instagram. Google search, Amazon, right? All of those things that have had undue influence on our lives, but we've had either a seat at the table because we've been able to set direction and actually contribute and really bring a different perspective for people to think about as they're building these products. Uh, and then not to mention the general generational wealth that is coming out of it all. No, absolutely. So do you see more women and BIPOC individuals kind of entering STEM fields? And what does this increase mean if the answer is yes for our communities and business? So it's a little bit tougher to answer because there are definitely 
more women, more folks of color who are getting degrees in STEM fields. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is not translating to them getting mm. more jobs. Mm. Uh, and so that is, uh, that's been a little bit of a, a of a, of a struggle. And so um, I, I, I think that there is one of the reasons why I put so much emphasis on, on having a seat at the table. Right. So there's going to be, I think it's what, by 2024, there's going to be like, I think it's 1.4 million open jobs in IT, right? Mm. And IT and tech jobs pay disproportionately more than your average bear. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the ability to be able to bring those resources and those finances into our communities can actually, again, make uh, an outsized difference. And so trying to figure out how that translation goes, right? So I think, you know, if you, you think if you just look at the stats on women, right, I think more women are graduating with college degrees, period, across the board in the U.S., but that's not mean that there's more women in the workforce or certainly at senior or senior levels. Uh, and so um, studying STEM and working in STEM, again, you face all of these other factors that go into it, um, which is kind of beyond just, just getting education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so Lisa, I want to talk about your company, Techwitable. Um, And so tell us more about the company and how can informal channels be used to address and get in front of workplace bias, discrimination, and harassment, which is what I understand this tool is kind of designed to help support. Yeah, yeah. So part of I, what I didn't, the second thing that I was going to say about my background, just to help you all understand a little bit about how we got here. So, right. Uh, you mentioned some of the my 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 previous work experience, and for me, you know, the common theme, the common thread that runs through most of them has been this idea of, I guess, I guess reinvention or really shifting of behaviors, right? So, Shockwave introduced animation, multimedia interactivity to the web. It was, you know, it made the web move mm -hmm. uh, and changed how people people consume the web and people's expectations of the web and again their behaviors on the web similarly with hulu the idea of 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 actually bringing video in a way that was different and more accessible uh to consumers and again it changed people's expectations about how 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 they should be able to access video Similarly at BET, uh, we did some pretty groundbreaking stuff in terms of trying to do some two-way communication, which is very different from broadcast, right? Which is one to many. Um, but for me, it was really when uh, I went to work at the White House under President Obama. So I was the Chief Digital Service Officer for the US Department of Education. But for me, it was really there that I kind of finally really internalized just how much we could harness technology to solve what had been previously thought of as intractable problems, right? Um, right? How do you make systemic level change? How do you make societal level change? So I worked on a project called College Scorecard, which mm -hmm. in just over three years has been credited with improving college graduation rates in the US by a point wow. and a half. And like, right, that's the idea, that's the dream. How do you make significant impact at scale? And I was like, as I was leaving the administration, right, trying to decide what I what I wanted to be when I grew up, because it, it is a journey. Um, I was like, look, this is not rocket science. If we can send a Tesla Roadster into outer space, right. right, we can use those same best practices, product development strategies, innovative approaches right here on our home planet to solve some of the issues for the underserved, the underrepresented, and the underestimated. And so that's how Techwitable came to be. But so what Techwitable is, is... Um, is our, our mission is to help companies create safe, equitable, and inclusive workplaces. Mm -hmm. So for example, if my if my boss makes a, a, a sexist crack or, or tries to touch my hair, right? That's not the totality of who they are. I'm not going to go to HR for that, right? Because that feels like the nuclear option. I'm not trying to get them fired, but I would like the behaviors to stop. Mm -hmm. Flip side of it is if I feel like I'm being overtly discriminated against, right? Then I want the company to take immediate action. And so what Techwitable tries to do is help the employee in either of those situations, figure out what their next step should be uh, and how they can move forward. And then simultaneously, oftentimes companies don't have a great sense for what's happening on the ground day to day. And so we try to provide data and insights back to them. 
So we provide the sounding board for employees where they can come, explore their options, get advice, figure out their next steps. And while they're doing that, we gather data that we anonymize and aggregate. We use that to identify systemic issues within an organization's culture, create a report for the management team, but with actionable recommendations. Uh, and uh, so that we can try to make change, right? We're trying to really create this virtuous cycle to mm -hmm. make systemic change. So that is, um, that's how we operate. And, and, and our, you know, our bailiwick is really about the, about the microaggressions, microaggressions, the micro inequities, right. the like, I joined a Zoom call with 20 other people on it. And I heard my, my boss didn't see me. I heard him talking about me. Well, what can I do? What should I say? How do I approach it? And so it's, it really has been, we've been doing it for, oh my goodness. I guess we first launched four years ago and it has just been so incredible to know how much we're helping employees mm -hmm. uh, and then how much we're also helping companies really make change. It's really just been a great experience. And I'm so grateful that I, this is what I do. It sounds amazing. It sounds incredibly robust. And so I want us to kind of slow walk this a little bit for this community, because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, I'm intrigued, have lots of curiosities. I want to learn more. So, so tell us more, Lisa. Give us some for instances, like who are your clients? What type of organizations are you supporting? And, um, and exactly how does this tool work? Yes, um, we support. So I'm trying to... Um, uh, I, so because of the nature of it, I just realized, um, I think, I think we actually have approval from all of our customers to be able to talk about them publicly. Um, you, there are a lot of brands that you will have heard of, <laughs> um, I, but I'm going to, I'm going to refrain. I'm going to try to speak vaguely just to, again, sure. protect these, um, I, I'm pretty sure we actually have permission, but, but I didn't, I'm sorry. I apologize. I should have confirmed that before. No, I. No, you're absolutely fine. And really I'm thinking about the types of companies are these, you know, only those bigger corporations with deep well of resources. Is there a version of this that allows smaller companies, nonprofits, you know, to be able to leverage something of this nature? That's really what yeah. I'm looking for. It's kind of a general high level. Absolutely. And that's, ex and that's exactly it, right? This idea of like, almost what we do is this idea of like almost just in time training, just in time coaching, yeah. right? It's not just executive coaching. It's just in the moment, something it's not, and it's not these, um, you know, uh, employee engagement services, which are great, but they're also w w a moment in time. This is right. like something happened to me now we, we also give advice back. It's not just a one way, you know, yeah. one, way, one, ch one way channel. So uh, we, our company, our customers range in size from 10 employees to 30,000 employees. Wow. Uh, we have folks in tech, in media, in finance, in healthcare. Um, and then for us, it's also not just, right, this, these are not just white collar issues. And so we also have... Um, there's a well-known coffee brand. Uh, so uh, that's one of our customers uh, that again, like we support their baristas and the folk who, folks who work in their production facilities and that kind of stuff. We support a union um, that, that works on film productions, a film production company. Um, so that's the idea. It really is because it turns out sadly, right? These issues are prevalent. They are happening at, in all industries, at all levels, at all different size companies. But so the way we actually operate is really around protecting privacy. We are looking across industries and across size organizations. So mm -hmm. thinking about uh, what are some of the best practices that a smaller organization can still put into place despite being 10 people or 100 people or 200 people. Mm -hmm. um, so just really, we really try to take lessons learned across right. the board and, and bring them together. Okay. So I am, I'm, I'm in an organization that happens to be, um, you know, a partner with Techbitable and um, I am experiencing some microaggressions. So I go to this tool and am I just kind of putting in a description of my situation? And then now all of this, you know, intel and data is being fed back to me to help me navigate the, what to do in those situations, how to respond, maybe questions to be self-reflective for how I'm feeling and processing. Just trying to get a better sense of this for our audience. Is that, can you, am I close? <laughs> And that's that's perfect. That okay. that's the right that's the right idea. So what we've really tried to do is we so everything we've done has been based on user research. It's really about going out and talking to folks and understanding kind of what their needs are, uh, what their problems are, and how we can help to 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 solve, pro provide solutions. So let me start with the basis around what an ombuds an ombudsman, which or an ombuds person or an ombuds, which is the term we use, is right. So um, the bottom line is. I mean, ombuds have been around 
for centuries, really. Um, but in the US, it's about the 1960s, mm-hmm. primarily found in academia, in government, some Fortune 500s like American Express, Chevron. Mm-hmm. They all have teams of human ombuds. And an ombuds is just a safe place where employees can come and figure and hand, uh, figure out to address, uh, get advice on workplace conflict. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We are a third party tech enabled ombuds, full stop. We follow all of the same principles and practices uh, that any organizational ombuds does. And those are put out by the IOA, the International Ombuds Association. Mm -hmm. So we are independent, so not beholden to the company's management structure. We are confidential, meaning we'll neither confirm nor deny someone's even spoken with us. We are impartial, so we don't advocate for the company. We don't advocate for the employee. We advocate for fairness of process. And then we're very specifically informal, um, sorry, uh, informal and off the record, right? So telling us something is not serving notice to the organization. Okay. Now with that structure in place, what that means is we are never going to tell somebody what to do. We are going to help them work through process and figure out what their next step should be. Ultimately, our idea is to uh, give the employee back some agency and help them figure out what their next steps are, because so often they feel like the control is taken out of their hands. Sure. So the way the ombuds process works is really, it's, I, I know, I think it's beautiful, obviously. Um, uh, so there's part art and part science, right? It's about helping the visitor move from their position. What is it they think they want to their interests? Why is that so fundamentally important to them? Help them identify the outcome they'd like to have happen and then develop an action plan to get there. Hmm. So, so to your point, um, so I'll, 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 well, I'll give you an example, and then I'll, I can talk a little bit about how, how, how it actually works, right? So we had somebody call up because um, she had applied for a promotion, and her boss said, don't worry about it. You'll make it to the next round because we have the Rooney rule in place, right? That requires at least one underrepresented candidate being a slate. Um, so she felt some kind of way about it, and she called him, and she's like, look, I don't need any advice. I just need management to know that you can't not talk about diversity and inclusion initiatives this way because it makes those of us who are underrepresented feel tokenized. Yeah. So got it, noted, heard it. But as we pulled at that thread a little bit, it turns out the crux of the issue was that she didn't feel like she was being recognized for the contributions she was making. Right. Mm-hmm. So we developed a bunch of strategies with her to help her get that validation from her boss, from her coworkers, and even externally. She walked away like, oh my God, thank you so much. I never would even have thought about this stuff, right? If I hadn't spoken with you. And that's the beauty. That's what we're trying to solve for. I see. Simultaneously, uh, you know, on the flip side, uh, we were able to tell the organization, right? That one of their teams had, their finance team had issues with bullying and abusive behavior, but their marketing team had issues with inequitable distribution of work and promotion. Because we have the color and the context from what's being fed in, we are able to make super actionable and tailored recommendations. But so going back to the to the process of how it actually works is, um, so it's a tech enabled ombuds, which means that uh, if you come to the platform, part of what we do is, as any ombuds would, we ask you, what brings you here today? Uh, and you'd be surprised. So we then there's a big empty box and some people, I just want to learn to be a better ally. Uh, and some people will will write for a page and a half. And But that's part of the unpacking process, right? It's helping you to think about like, well, what's important? What do I want to say here? And how do I want to say this? Right. Um, and then the next step is talking about like, well, what do you want to have happen? Um, and so the way we approach this was as a, as a visitor, right, you can, um, we have things like what we call action modules, right? So mm-hmm. strategies on how to have a tough conversation or, um, or you can come get a script that you could use to address the issue directly yourself with your boss or with your coworker, right? We really do believe in fostering a culture of healthy and open communication. Um, we have a little interactive element that we call a conversation starter, which really, it just helps an employee build an I statement, right? When you did such and such, be objective here. It made me feel, were you sad, angry, frustrated? But for us, the thing we heard, oh, uh, so we also have um, action modules for allies too. So things like how to be an active bystander, right? So if you see something happening to somebody else, what can you do about it? I will say one of the things I'm really proud of is about 20% of the data that comes into us is somebody writing in about something that happened to somebody else. And Mm -hmm. to me, that's the win, right? It's not a 
bad thing to use the platform. It's a really positive thing. It's helping to create a company culture. If you see something, say something, do something. But we heard from so many people, well, how do I know it's not just me? Am I being too sensitive? So we created a library of stories where people could see themselves uh, 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 reflected without having to take aggressive action, right? So um, he told me I'd be pretty if I smiled more, right? So every story in narrative form covers four topics, what happened to me, how it made me feel, because that's really the thing that resonates, right? I walked away with a pit in the bottom of my stomach, what I did about it, and then what the end, what the outcomes were. And, and we're really trying to uh, uh, meet the visitor wherever it is. They, they can also call and talk to a professional ombuds at any point. Oh. We just, you know, different people have different learning styles. Some people want to step one, step two, step three, step four. Some people want to ease their way into it. Some people want to talk to somebody, whatever that might look like. So that's what we're trying to do. I have just talked a ton. <laughs> I'm going to take it down a notch. <laughs> No, but Lisa, this was so good because I can only imagine that maybe our audience has been holding a lot of curiosities to really deepen their understanding of exactly how Techlitable works. And I believe that just with the commentary you shared in that last stint, it certainly has given me a, a deeper and better understanding. Um, I want to bring into the conversation something that I see in chat because I think it, it could um, provide value for the rest of us as well as we're attempting to get some clarity. And this is from Anne Kingston. She says, I love this concept. How do people learn about your organization? Is it largely word of mouth? And my big tech firm, they is a deep, there is a deep mistrust of the ombuds process. You may experience that. So I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about that. And people don't always know the extent of what options looks like when there's um, when there's an issue beyond assuming. Um, I'm having a hard time actually reading the rest of it. And it may mean that someone is about to lose their. Here it goes. <laughs> Look like when there's an issue beyond assuming it means someone is about to lose a job or worse, nothing ever changing. So um, do you sense that there are a lot of people who are um, maybe a little leery of the whole ombuds, you know, process? You kind of referenced that a moment ago. Um, yeah, I can address it. But I see that Anne also came on camera. Do you want to oh, add yeah. more <laughs> color context? Yeah, thank you. So um, I often have women coming to me in my organization just to vent. And I always tell them, you know, like, I'm, I'm happy to hear you out if you just have to get it off your chest. If you want to do something about it, like, I'm happy to go like through the policy with you, share the resources. You know, we have like an email list. We have a committee you can talk to. But people tend to think of these binaries that like, well, it's not bad enough for me to leave my job. And I know they're not going to lose their job because they're, you know, perceived to be such a valuable business leader. Um, and if I'm not leaving and they're not leaving, then like really nothing's probably going to change. Right. So it, it seems to be like people think of these two extremes. Um, but yeah, again, I, I love that your organization exists and I definitely think there's, um, <laughs> A, a need for <laughs> yeah um no i think it's a great question i i think there's 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 multiple parts to it so the first thing that we part of what we're trying to do is take the the ombuds process and amplify it and also make it more accessible and by that i mean it doesn't have to be a big egregious terrible thing that happened right it's it's the, you know, I'm always mistaken for the other person of my race in my building, even though we look nothing alike, right? It's those kinds of things that we want to help people kind of process and work through. Now, the example that you gave in terms of, well, I don't want to leave my job and that person is, you know, valued at the company. Um, that is a, that's a specific outcome. And it turns out when you work and talk with people and you actually really kind of pull out what's really important, that the key part, I think, one of the key parts of what we do is the moving from position to interest, which is, is your goal to really get them fired? Is it to protect yourself? And because we're a neutral, it's not about like, yeah, that person is in the wrong. It's more about like, well, how are you feeling about it? How is it affecting you? What can you put into place so that it doesn't get you in that kind of way? Like how, right? So it's not, uh, and so, and helping them process and ask those kinds of questions. Um, 
If you're going to go back and have a tough conversation with your manager, okay, one, have you ever had a tough conversation with them before? How did it go? Have you ever seen anybody else have a tough conversation with them? Is there anything that you could learn from that? Um, if you were to say it in this kind of way, how do you think that they would respond or react? Would it feel authentic to you if you said it that way? What's the worst thing that could happen? What's the scariest thing? And are there things that we could put into place uh, to mit help you mit or for you to mitigate those risks? So it's really, it's it's not, a, again, it's not a formal channel. It's not like, okay, that person's going to get fired because you talked to equitable. We're confidential. Um, we actually, we, we don't do that. We're an informal channel and off the record. So but the idea of helping people process, sometimes people just need to vent, right? Sometimes they really do want to figure out like, well, what, what, what can they do about it or what, right? Especially when it comes to microaggressions, like one of the things we talk about is, you know, is it this, what does the win look like? Yeah. Right. If, if you had a magic wand and everything really went well, what would have changed at the end? Um, and then backing out from that, Right. Are you, it, it, is this the right time and place? Is the, what does the power dynamics look like? Will you still feel safe if you do it? Do you want to engage an ally? Do you want to get, like, bring somebody else into the room? Just, just helping people process as opposed to, hey, they're going to get fired, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And frequently, what I've heard over the years is, you know, if you're like the one woman on the team and you're experiencing sexism, you know, and you want to maybe report something, but you're worried about like, maintaining some level of anonymity when, you know, by process of deduction, it doesn't take long, you know, to, to go back to the source. And then we also have situations when like, maybe it's a client who's being inappropriate. And, you know, then it's like that next level of threat, like, you don't always want to confront your boss. But you know, when that person is a paying customer on a big account, whatever it is, um, it, it can get a little hairy. So um, yeah, I appreciate you expanding on that. I know a lot of people don't tend to know what ombuds is sort of offhand. And when they do, they tend to think, oh, well, you're just here to protect the company, sort of like HR when people try to say, you know, you're not really after the employee interest ultimately. Yeah. So ombuds, ombuds very specifically, like that's the whole point. And especially a third party ombuds, yeah. right? there's not you know we don't we're not we are independent from the management structure yeah great thank you so much Ann. we really appreciate your contributions to the conversation so what i'm hearing i am i'm so intrigued by because i love this forced self-reflection right which i think sometimes is missed when we are seeking counsel and coaching it's almost like we want to get immediately towards the solution and sometimes in that person's mind who feels that they're the victim that solution is do something about that person right and i think that it works both ways i think that part of also us navigating the complexities of of work environments where where difference is is obviously prevalent um, is being able to have the self-agency to know what do I do if I encounter this situation again? Or how when someone else comes to me and they encounter it, how can I be of support and a resource to them? Um, what I'm curious about though is I would imagine that there are circumstances where people perhaps are presenting information that feels a little bit as though there's an obligation or responsibility to alert the organization. How do you get around that? Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, so I, I will say the truth is the, the vast, vast majority of what people come to us for are the microaggressions, the micro inequities. That is, that is kind of the space, because that's also the thing that's happening in the day to day. It's not that other stuff doesn't, but this, it all the time, right? And that's why we've created content like about burnout, about we created a piece of content that's um working from home while parenting makes me feel like I'm drowning. Like there's just all this stuff going on, right? In, in your everyday work life. In terms of, um, in terms of reporting, so we have a, a strict uh, line in the sand uh, around confidentiality. Was it just only if if some if someone is in imminent risk of bodily harm to self or others, right? That is that is the line in the sand. Other sure. than that, again, we're never going to tell somebody what to do. But if something does rise to the level of needing to be escalated, the question becomes like, all right, well, would you feel comfortable going to HR? If not, why not? What do you think the repercussions would be? Or again, similarly, it's all about the like, let's let's work through process it and figure out a way that if what you want it, if what you if what you want the outcome to be is for it to stop, well, let's talk about how we can get that to happen, right? And so it's really just about helping them process through it. It's so much to your point about self-agency and self-reflection. 
Yeah, so I want to invite the audience to think about some of the questions perhaps you would like to present to Lisa or maybe some contributions to the conversation. And just a moment, I will transition and allow um, those of you who are interested, if you could just raise your hand, that's how I know that you would like to share, I will invite you to unmute yourself and do so. Um, or if you would just like your question presented on your behalf, feel free to go to the chat. Um, so I want to talk about maybe some of the big wins. I would imagine that there are these full circle moments. You've said, I don't tell people what what to do, or we don't tell people what to do. We help guide and provide resources for them to, you know, to reach their own decisions. But I would imagine that perhaps there is some mechanism where maybe you're getting feedback from the individuals who've used the tools. What are some of those big wins or success stories that stand out to you, Lisa? Yeah, yeah. So what we do is, again, because we protect private uh, confidentiality and privacy, we have a minimum cell size of five. And so if we start to see, and so we look at the data that we're getting in both quantitatively, but also qualitatively. And so as we start to, um, to, to, to peel out and to, uh, see other things that are happening frequently. So for example, actually, um, the person, that example that I gave, who, 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 who was looking for that promotion, I will say that company, it turns out that there were uh, that we got stuff that was both sides of that coin, right? So we had other people say similar things to what she did, but then we also had white cis straight men say, "I never get to do nothing at this company because I'm not underrepresented." Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the conversations that we had specifically with that organization was, "Well, let's talk about." communication. Let's talk about your DNI initiatives and how you're actually speaking about them and how you can actually train your managers, mm -hmm. right? Can you give them both two talking points, right? Not long things, but because, because they're going to be the first line of defense. And if they flub it, right, then it starts to snowball and get worse. And so that's the idea is so much of it ends up being about communication because, because it's not about, you know, the idea about um, inequitable distribution of work and promotion. You know, the company was like, well, is that true? Is that's what's happening? And the point is, it doesn't really matter if it is or it isn't it there's a perception that it is and that right. is a thing that also needs to be addressed so helping them really kind of reflect on that um we had somebody um so again thinking about some of the systemic things um we talked to one company, and again, we try to, because of the platform usage, we try to look to see, you know, what's popping off, if there's hot topics. And this particular company, uh, we did a report for them, and one of their top three pieces of content was, my manager is always taking credit for my work. And that is not a top three piece of content, mm -hmm. actually, to any of our other customers. And so yeah. we just kind of, we noted it. And the person we were talking with was like, oh, I know how we incent managers to make that going to be an issue here, right? It was, she she could actually pinpoint the parts of her culture that were incenting folks to behave in that kind of way. And yeah. so just having that reflection, then being able to take that and be like, all right, we should change that incentive structure, right? That making making sure that, uh, that managers are actually getting promoted and recognized for lifting up their teammates, not mm -hmm. for the work, that, right, taking credit for their work. So it's that kind of stuff that ultimately we're trying to create this full loop to change. Yeah, and it would seem that you would need a good bit of, of data from those organizations to be able to see where there's maybe a, a trend or recurring themes that then would surface up into some type of report or conversation. Linroy in our community, he actually shares a really a really good point in the chat, but um, he, he says, I would think that would be a challenge with small companies like those maybe with 10 employees because, you know, it's kind of easy to identify you know, who could be um, using this service. And so how, how do you address this when um, the company size is small? Yeah, when we first started, I was worried about doing small companies. I, we actually didn't. And then we, we tried a couple and we realized that what we could do is provide best practices. Okay. So especially because, right, a lot of like a 10-person company doesn't necessarily have a head of DEI. And so the idea yeah. of, you know, helping them kind of figure out some of the basic things that they should be thinking about or looking at. And we, so, right, we look, we try to bring them best practices for their industry as well as for their size. Okay. That's one thing. The other thing that we've done is um, we have a small cohort of, well, it's not so much small anymore. We have a cohort of nonprofits, but when we started, there were seven. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we also, so again, we look at things across industries. So um, they were all pretty small nonprofits. 
And we saw recurring themes across the seven. So we didn't get five from any one company, but we actually got five across the seven hmm. that showed um, the, I mean, the thing was um, the, the culture, the norms, the values that we espouse externally are not reflected internally in terms of how we treat each other and how we communicate with each other. And we saw that across all of them, uh, but not again in five. But so that idea, so we were able to come back and bring that back as a recommendation or as a best practice or as a theme or a trend, again, specifying that it was because we looked at across across the, the their, at least the cohort, that industry. And so we were able to make recommendations based on that, if that makes sense. No, it does make sense. I love the fact that there's also an opportunity to share data just across different industries. I think that's useful as well. Um, so I'm going to go to my next question because I'm not seeing any hands raised so far, but I want to talk about Roe versus Wade, and I want to talk about it specifically as it relates to um, the tools and how technology is now being able to serve in a role. Um, so you have a new health platform that you're working on, which is you know designed to help women in light of the new Roe versus Wade decision. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. I'm really, really excited about this. Uh, and honestly, it came because somebody called us up and said, we need some help. Um, and and I am super happy to have a, a, a dog in that fight. Um, so one of the things is, you know, a ton of companies have been stepping up and saying, you know, healthcare access, reproductive he healthcare access is an equity issue, right? Having right. equitable access is really important. Uh, and so in order to provide that, they're providing travel stipends, extra days off in order for uh, folks to be able to leave the state if they need to, to access reproductive health care, whether it's abortion, whether it's plan B, whatever that might look like. Um, the challenge is, and the big risk is companies can provide that stipend, but that means, can you imagine being an employee and having to call up your manager and say, right. hey, I need an abortion. Like, can I get this stipend? That, that's right. That, that They start kind of really encroaching on people's right. privacy, not to mention that it also makes the companies kind of puts them at risk also for, right, for the states coming after them. Um, and so what we've provided is this product called a health benefits navigator. Uh, what we try to do is similarly to our ombuds platform is we uh, we try to help the employee figure out kind of what their next step should be, how they want to process stuff. If they have questions about the benefits that are offered, uh, we can serve as inter an intermediary. Uh, we do that today with with other with other um, other uh, kind of internal company policies as well, right? Well, they call up and they ask us a question. And we can then go to to the internal team and we ask five questions so that you can't tell who asked what sure. uh, related. Um, so we do that kind of stuff and provide them that support. But then also this idea of providing this intermediary so that uh, we can do verification and validation on the services provided to the employee. Uh, and then we just send a note to the company saying that they've been verified, but there's no additional information. So the company just knows that, um, that the employee is uh, eligible for the stipend for essential medical services, right? So you don't even know what for yeah. what exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we don't keep records. The company doesn't keep records. And so everybody's privacy is protected. Uh, and so that I'm really, really proud of 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 being able to help in this way because, you know, it's part of what ombuds do is around confidentiality, is around privacy and helping people kind of trans uh, transition and work through these issues. And so being able to help do this in this, it's a very specific need right now. Uh, and so I'm really, really proud that we're, we're, uh, we're launching this product. No, as you should be. One of the first things that I um, took notice of, you know, after the, um, the Roe versus Wade decision, I, um, I began to think about how organizations are navigating this. And many, as you have shared, were you know, coming out with, we're going to provide the time off and even like the, the stipends or the, the financial means for people to be able to go to a different state if necessary to, to get um, an abortion. And um, I immediately thought, well, what does that look like when you have to take advantage of that and ask for that? And that's where I felt like companies were not thinking intently about the consequences there, you know, what does that look like? So it was kind of this knee jerk reaction without fully considering the consequences. And it sounds Lisa, like this is, this is one of those potential solutions to help address that. So yeah, so glad, so glad to hear it. Um, so I want to talk about equity 
I, I would imagine that the work that you've been doing with, with your products is certainly has given you a great wealth of knowledge around some of the equity do's and don'ts that perhaps you often like to amplify. So um, knowing that this tool is mostly directed towards the individual helping to guide them towards decision making, I know that a lot of times, you know, there's a, a big emphasis too on what are we doing at the systems level to also help ensure that there's a parallel path. We're giving people the self-agency to, to advocate and to navigate, but at the same time, we have to fix the system as well. So I just want to get your thoughts on what are some of the things that you're seeing from an equity perspective, the do's and don'ts that are, um, are necessary to socialize around impacting the systems while this other tool that you have is guiding the individual. Well, I think they feed into each other, right? Because that's how stuff is being surfaced. So I'll just give you an example. And because everything we do, we come at it from an equity lens, right? And so, so for example, actually, even processing for the health benefits navigator for all the companies that we've been speaking with, we actually are, are helping them expand their mindset a little bit, right? So for example, the first people who came to us, they were like, okay, we need to provide support for, you know, women who need abortions. And we were like, okay, cool. So it's not just women who need abortions, right? So do you want to use the word, you know, people with uteride? Do you want to use people who have capability of becoming pregnant, right? So thinking about that, is it just abortions? What about plan B? What about fertility treatments? What about transgender transgender healthcare, mm -hmm. right? What about, what about if I have cancer and I need chemo, but I can get a better facility, you know, in the state and in the state next door. So helping them think about that. Um, Think about, well, who are these benefits eligible, uh, uh, available to? Is it just if it's the employee who needs the, the service? What if it's their spouse or partner? What if it's their child, right? Helping them think through, through that stuff. Um, what about, uh, um, you know, they, they, I have like a, a bazillion example of like, as especially because this is so new to everybody, but sure. that's part of what we're trying to do is really help people think about through an equity lens. We did this when people started reopening offices or actually even before they started reopening offices the to take a hard look at the people that were being asked to come in um, because we actually mm -hmm. had some companies, some organizations where the younger people feel like they were feeling like they were disposable because the companies were asking them to kind of to jeopardize and risk their lives to come in, take public transportation, to come into an office. And so helping, helping organizations kind of really reflect on that and build up internal systems. We had one organization where they had created a new team uh, and um, and it was going to transform their organization, but it was all for, it was four white men who were assigned to lead it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were like, well, how do we, what do we do so that we make sure this doesn't happen again? Right. right? So it's that kind of idea of just helping people it dep it, every organization is going to be different, but so to you, right around DEI issues, talk about, think about communication for that particular company. Uh, but so it really is, and that's the beautiful thing is that because we're hearing all the detail, we can be so super specific and tailored. Yeah, so we are live on LinkedIn today. Uh, we do, we have been past couple of weeks taking our podcast live on LinkedIn. So there is a question from one of our LinkedIn viewers, um, Angela B, and her question is this, Lisa, this is very thoughtful product and service. I wonder if you use data to inform the types of remedies um, that you recommend. You mentioned aggressive action and viewing incidents as egregious, touching hair, all these specific race specific issues. Who is determining the recommended remedies proposed to the employees? Yeah, well, so 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 I think there's there's kind of two different answers to that. The first is um, again, we're never telling somebody what yep. to do. It's really about helping them kind of process and look through it. But so for example, um, we had um, somebody call in because uh, she had um, one of her coworkers had a, a severe nut allergy and she'd inadvertently brought an almond milk latte into the office. Mm -hmm. He is a small company. He went to the company Slack and accused her of trying to kill him. Uh, and uh, and so she calls up and she's in tears. She's like, I've loved this company. Am I gonna have to leave this company, right? Oh my God, why do I have to go? One, two, she was like, who does that? Who like maligned your character and like accuses you of trying to murder him? Three, she was also Persian. 
And so she was like, is he accusing me of being a terrorist? Like there was just layers and layers and layers as they're all in so many of the interpersonal mm -hmm. uh, um, conflicts. So, you know, she didn't feel like she was getting the support she, was, uh, she, uh, she needed from the organization or from her manager. Her manager and, uh, and he, the three of them were gonna meet. One of the things we suggested for starters was, hey, maybe reach out to your manager and ask uh, what the agenda for the meeting is or what, what the outcomes they're shooting for are. Um, partially to encourage them to think about that ahead of time. Um, but then the other thing we did was we sent her an excerpt of the book, uh, Nonviolent Communication, so that in the meeting, mm -hmm. uh, she could say things in a way that they would be received. Uh, and uh, I will say, so that one, uh, there's a few that I'm incredibly proud of, but this is another one where um, uh, not, not, so the meeting went well, they resolved the situation, but not only did that happen, her skip level manager, her boss's boss was so impressed with how professionally she'd handled the situation. He actually asked her to apply for a promotion. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's the idea. And so, and so again, part of it is, you know, we are all steeped and grounded in, you know, cultural competency in, in all of the books. We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel. There's a ton of research and shows that what's effective and what works and all that stuff. Uh, and then, and then built on that, the cultural competency, the empathy, and the idea of like asking the questions to help people reframe their own mindsets, just that that's how it all comes together. No, I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're getting close to our time, but I do want to talk about the great resignation before we let you go. Um, it's really more of the great reveal, which is now how it's being reframed by so many. But what is this trend telling us about what employees need from their workplaces and and how 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 do they fix it? Yeah, I, I you know, I think I think that that so much is about also a company culture being authentic, right? There's the like, oh, we have our values up on our website, uh, yeah. but then how do you actually live them? How are they being, um, I want to use the word inculcated, but I'm not sure I know what that means, uh, but how are they being manifested uh, in the day to day? And so um, I, I think people are speaking with their feet, right? First yeah. of all, I think Gen Z is going to save us all, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, but people are speaking with their feet. They're deciding what their priorities are, what their values are, right? So many more people are saying like, this is not what I'm not going to tolerate not being treated well. I want a company that's going to invest in uh, in social good, in the, in my well-being, in my community's well-being, in taking a stand and saying something and taking action. Um, and so to me, you know, that that's, you know, that's not how I came up and you, you, you know, you, you need a J-O-B, you need a J-O-B, right? Like there's no, when I left college, again, without a college degree, I was making twice what my parents made combined. Um, but that idea of figuring out how to marry your personal needs with your ideological needs and then bring your whole self to work and mm -hmm. be set up for success in that way. And I mean, again, you all know, right? All the studies show a psychological safety right is the number one critical factor in making teams successful. And so it it it, it benefits organizations and companies bottom lines at the end of the day, right? It makes it reduces absenteeism, it reduces turnover, it improves productivity, it improves innovation, right? It's going to have a, a business impact and end result. So companies thinking about it, right? It it yes, they can think about it for the social good, but they can also think about it for what their bottom line is going to look like. Yeah. So we talked about the great resignation or the great reveal. You know, there's also lots of talk right now around what has been labeled as quiet quitting, um, which I will share that I think is, you know, at least the nomenclature of that is quite problematic. <laughs> um, but I just want to get your thoughts and your sentiments around this quiet quitting phenomenon that has surfaced and that there's a lot of conversation happening right now in social media. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is there, is there merit to it? Is, uh, you know, and is that something that, um, you know, organizations should be watchful of or should they lean into it and see it not as quitting, but as, you know, really leaning into those boundaries that people are communicating that they need? Um, so I just want to give you a chance to kind of socialize your thoughts. I guess what I was, do we think it's new? Uh, right, <laughs> well, people, true. Yeah, people I know. Doing. People yeah. been doing that, and I and I think yeah. that there is, it, and I I guess I'm not mad at it either. Like I yeah. don't, 
I like I that that's not that is it is okay for you to figure out where your borders are, what what is important to you, what your values are, what your priorities are, where you want to contribute, where you want to draw that line. Again, this goes back to, I mean, I think that's one of the things that the um, <clears throat> the uh, pandemic or the shutdown based on the pandemic has actually uh, helped us really realize is, is we've had to stand up and be more concrete about here is, mm, this is where it stops, right? Because if not, right, the 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 moving from your, your, you know, one side of the couch to the other side of the couch, right? Since you're now working all in the same place at the same time, figuring out where your boundaries are, how you want to define your life, what's important to you, how do you make it all work together? I think it just uh, put an emphasis on it, but I also think it's work that, I think it's stuff that people have been doing forever. Yeah, my colleague Autumn placed into the chat that it used to be referred to as working to rule. So yes, lots of lots of great things that um, I know we could continue to have conversation around, but our time is up now. But I certainly want to thank you so much, Lisa, for coming and sharing such enlightening information with us. We are super excited to learn more about Techwitable. And um, I know that we have placed the, the link to the website in um, the chat. So we hope this community will go and learn even more. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to close this out in your own way. If there's something I have not asked you about that you're feeling a lot of energy around and you want to just socialize it. I want to give you that chance to do so. And um, I want to also just thank this community for joining us today. So Lisa, you have the last words. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for actually bringing me into this community. I think these questions were fantastic. Uh, and I really love to see the engagement and the thoughtfulness about it. I think the questions were great. Uh, and just really thinking about, again, um, what you can do to make systemic change. And I think, right, the idea of like, it's it's not about civil bullets, it's about really affecting change. It's gonna help the employee as well as the company. And that's the thing that we're really focused on. So uh, I'm grateful for you all putting in the time and doing the work too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you next week on Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. Take care. <laughs>